Okay. Okay, so uh, it's a little later than I planned. I was planning to get to this uh, the day after the last video that I sent, but it looks like it's going to be closer to about a week later. But that's okay. I had a crazy week. Um, but here's here's basically what I do next. I've got all of these smeared up paintings that are just sort of that came out of that mess that I made in the first video. I made a bunch of messes, right? That's step number one. Um, now, because I want to make sure that I can sort of do this sort of before and after thing, I photographed all of these while I was over at the studio. And to make sure that they would line up uh, with one another, I also numbered them. So they've got little numbers on them, just so that I know which one goes with which one. Because it's actually more difficult than it seems. And I've also even started playing with them a little bit, just trying to see, sort of figure out what I wanted to do with style. And these are a few that I've already sort of started to mess with. And so I was on a telephone call with my friend Ralph, and I just sit and scribbled well. I was talking to Ralph, and that gave me, you know, just an interesting distraction, so I wasn't thinking too much about it. Because what I want to try to do when I'm working on this next level is really just compose. If the first one's really just craftsmanship, I'm just making a mess, but I'm just playing with paint, um, that's really about craft. This next one is also, to a certain degree, about just sort of trying to clean up the craftsmanship a little bit, try to, try to use um, a variety of different tools. Most of what I like to use are markers and some pencils and some... Uh, um, Small pens, you know, these micron pens are pretty good. A uh, little bit of beer helps a lot. And use these different tools to sort of work together on making compositions. Because if the first part is really about making a mess, the second part's about cleaning it up. And what, normally what I'm thinking about when I'm cleaning it up is how to uh, sort of affect the composition. Because this is a perfectly nice composition as is. It's kind of got... Uh, uh, it's got interesting color, it's got interesting shapes that are sort of forming here, but it's certainly um, not very well organized, and the composition is arbitrary, it's totally random. And what I want to try to do when I'm playing with these next is to sort of try to affect that composition and try to clean it up, you know, sort of uh, develop a more carefully considered composition, something that uh, is sort of organized, that's sort of balanced, that has some sort of harmony, visual harmony, has some sort of logic to it. And so what I'm probably going to focus on the most in the process of doing this is one of the design elements. I've already got color, which is one of the design elements. Um, and there's a variety of different values, lights and darks, a variety of different hues, reds, yellows, and, and oranges, and purples, and blacks, and stuff. Um, so I've got lots of, lots of different color. Um, and I've got a lot of different values. So, so what I want to probably play with is another design element, you know, which is going to sort of help me sort of control the composition, which is line. Um, and I'm also going to play in the same time playing with another compositional element, which is going to be space, figure ground, positive, negative space. The idea of playing with the idea of, uh, um, you know, trying to make an object in a place. Now, in some cases, it doesn't have to be a very recognizable object. It could just be like this white thing. This sort of looks like some weird combination of a, of a, uh, um, I don't know, maybe a bird and bones or a pair of football pants or something, you know, a pair of, you know, some sort of, uh, um, some sort of an object. It's not a specific object, but it's just an object-like thing. Um, like there's this object that's in the foreground and this object that's in the middle ground against this blue plane that's in the background. Even if they're not recognizable objects, I can still think of them as figures or objects in the foreground, middle ground, and background, positive space and negative space sort of thing, right? So I'm going to be playing. I'm going to be creating space while I'm playing with line, and so that so most of what I'm doing here is composing. I'm just arranging the elements in some sort of way. You know, I've got this weird little circle up here, or this weird little circle up here. It's another way to break up the space, right? By using shapes. Shapes are another design element. I've got rectangles out here, and I've got circles here, and so I'm just using these various design elements to try to compose line, shape, color, texture, form. Um, and I've already sort of got texture and color, so I'm going to play more with line, shape, and form, um, and, and space. So I just have to sort of decide on one to start with. I could just start with literally with number one in my stack here, or just start with any random one. I'm not too concerned about doing them in the proper order. Um, it's more that I just have them in order so that I can uh, um, sort of get at them again later. All I'm really trying to decide is if there's one that I like more than another one. I have figured out sort of a recipe that I can play with for these, and I've figured out a recipe for these. This happens to be number one. 
Maybe I could just play with number one first, just because then it decides for me which one to do first. I'll just start with this. Um, what I'm seeing right away with this is that there's obviously this bright, this big white shape that's in the foreground. That's already sort of grabbing my attention. That's something that I can play with, something that I can design with, something that I can take further and I can sort of emphasize more. So then I could make a shape by defining that shape, I can sort of end up with a with an object, and then that would sort of create a background opposite it. Um, with this series so far, I have done a few things that I'm going to sort of consider to be consistencies. I want to talk, as I'm working on this, I'm going to talk a tiny bit about what I mean by a series, you know, and really a series just has, is a, is a number of artworks that have some design unity um, to them, and then they sort of hold together. And one thing that I've done with a lot of these pieces in this series is to start by sort of creating... Um, uh, frame for them and that sort of helps define figure ground in one way um, in that I'm sort of deciding that there's a space that's in bounds and a space that's out of bounds. Um, it also sort of helps because I'm putting a shape inside of a shape that creates a um, sort of a target, you know, a circle inside of a circle draws your attention towards the center like a target and similarly a rectangle inside of a rectangle sort of emphasizes that rectangularness of it and sort of creates that sort of um, target effect where it draws your eye towards the center. And so I'm going to just going to continue to play with that. I'm just going to grab one of these markers. I'm going to grab a thicker marker to make this frame nice and dense and very visible. And that will just sort of get the ball rolling, just that I have made a decision. Um, and I've made this decision as a consistency across many of the different pieces that I've made. And that makes it a uh, sort of a design consistency for the series. Um, generally when I think about a series, I think about, you know, I'm making several pieces. I'm not making identical twins, uh, but I'm making siblings. So I start with one artwork and then I say, well, what do I like about that one? And what do I want to sort of end up with in the one to make it seem as though it's related to the other one, right? That it's like a brother or a sister to the other one. You know, which character traits do I want to bring over and which ones do I want to sort of leave off? And so one thing that I just happen to like a lot is by defining that frame, for some reason it sort of tells me that the stuff inside the frame follows one set of rules, the stuff outside follows another set. There's some place where you can see the frame really clearly, somewhere it's harder to see. Something that I've done in the parts where it's harder to see the frame on some of these other ones is that I've sort of gone and I've added a little bit of this blue to sort of bring that part out. I tend to do that later, just to really make emphasize the frame. I'll probably do that a little later because Magic marker, especially Sharpie, doesn't like to go over top of the waxy uh, colored pencils. So I'll do the colored pencil later in the process. And really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to decide what is it that, how do I want to emphasize this? And generally one of the easiest ways to do that, as I said, is to use lines and use those lines to help sort of draw it out. Um, I like these graphic pens. They just tend to make nice lines. They make, um, each one of these has a different uh, um, number on it. And so uh, that basically is the weight of the stroke. So this is like a 0 0.02. This one's a 0 0.005. You know, so it's going to be a thinner one. This one's a 0 0.01. So I can get progressively smaller strokes. And then this one is a little more, this one's the thickest. And so usually I'll sort of start with, I, actually, of course, it's not the thickest because I do have other thicker Sharpies over here. I've got these and I've got these. And, I've got actually a Magnum too that I used on a couple of the other ones, which is a really, really thick one. But basically, I'm just using this to sort of help describe the shape. You know, as soon as I define that shape, then I've sort of got a jumping off point. I've sort of decided that it's something that matters, and it's just a compositional element that I can start working with. When I'm cleaning it up, I have to start somewhere. I don't always know exactly what I'm doing, but until I start, I'm just sort of, uh, I don't have anything to do. So by just making a choice, and in this case the choice is to just outline this white thing, I've got something to do. And as I'm outlining that white thing, I'm just making it pop out more. It becomes more of a dominant visual element because the stroke helps make the shape seem more important and it's basically also sort of helps describe that shape and give it more contrast against the background. So I'm sort of going back and forth between talking about some of the design elements, and some design principles, and these things are what makes um, composition work. It, it, they're basically building blocks to composition. Um, and so a lot of what I try to do is to just sort of, you know, over time I've sort of developed an understanding of these design elements and principles, and they really sort of help steer my decision making because I don't have to, I don't know, reinvent the wheel.
And so I sort of think about them a little bit while I'm working. And it just gives me a, a, a helps me make decisions while I'm just starting. And all right, so basically I have described this big white blob that's in the middle. I've just outlined it. But now as soon as I've outlined it, I start to see that some lines seem to sort of con connect. So like this line seems to connect over to there. This some of these lines seem as though they could be if I if I connected them, they would, it would make sense that they're connected. Others, uh, as soon as I divide it like this, now I've sort of created a shape that's sitting on top of a shape or something, right? And I start describing, you know, some of these subshapes that are inside of here. So now this object just appeared because I described, you know, I just connected those marks. As soon as that object appears, now it has you know, a relationship to the other objects that are there. They're those Are they stacked? Is one on top of the other? Are they connected? Are they sort of bolted to one another? Which one is in, most in the foreground? Which one's in the background? And so on. Those sort of become questions that I can answer. But I'm just looking for, at this point, where does it feel like the lines want to connect? In other words, like this, they're, like this line and this line sort of seemed like they were already visually connected. I'm just enhancing that by actually connecting those dots. And again, like you can do it in so many different ways, so I'm just making some decisions, and I'm, it, that's what you have to do as a composer. You have to decide, well, I'm going to try doing this and see if I like it. And if I like it, then I, I'm good. If I don't like it, I can undo it. Well, I can't, excuse me, I guess I can't undo it. If I don't like what I did, I guess I have to try to work with it. Um, you know, if, if obviously if I was working in pencil, I could erase it, but if I'm working in marker, I can't erase it. I have to live with it. But it's kind of like, uh, then it comes down to this idea of playing with improvisation. If you make a noise in a band and it's the wrong noise, well, sometimes you can get away with it if you do that noise about four more times, because then it seems like you did it on purpose. And that's an improvisational strategy. You know, if you uh, screw up, then screw up three more times, and then it seems like it's on purpose. And if nobody knows what the song sounds like, then they won't know that you messed up. And I'm just sort of continuing to go through here and subdivide and make all of these little shapes sort of seem to make sense. Now, this isn't something that I'm inventing. I've, there's a lot of people that have made drawings like this. One of my favorite uh, um, buddies that um, I used to hang out with a lot is this guy up here on the wall. This guy's name is Chris Hales. He made all of these really awesome drawings. He just used this strategy. He, you know, we would used to hang out and draw together, me, him, uh, my buddy, uh, um, Colin, you know, um, Phil, we would hang out at the Chicago Art Department or over at Transamoeba and we'd draw. And this is a way to draw. If you don't know what to draw, then just make a mess and just start outlining it with marker. It doesn't necessarily make art. It makes compositions. And those compositions are just arrangements of elements of art. You know, ultimately, for myself, I don't really consider it art just because I've arranged elements and just because I've used art tools. I like to sort of think about, you know, there are various stages in the process of making art, and this is one stage in the process of making art. But for me, it's not really art until it sort of has a meaning or it represents something, even if it represents just an idea. I like to take it just that one step further before I really, you know, have a relationship with it as art. For myself, it's when it means something, then it's sort of art. So lots of times until I title it, I don't really see it as really being art yet. And again, um, everybody's a little bit different as far as how they sort of see that relationship between craft and art. I consider the use of these tools as just a craft that I've perfected. And I think that uh, when I start communicating messages or I think of some purpose or I think of some um, meaning, then it sort of transcends a little bit from being craft to being art. But again, that's sort of me. Everybody's a little different about that. You can use these crafts to make art. But just because you're using a craft doesn't mean you're actually making art. That's just my philosophy. All right, so I haven't quite figured out exactly what's going to be happening in the background, but I have, I think, sort of at least currently essentially refined most of the foreground and figured out that there is something happening in this area. 
And as I'm doing it, I'm sort of trying to think, you know, what does it do for me? I mean, I'm sort of calling, these have something to do with autumn because of their colors, and I like that about them. Uh, but I don't necessarily know exactly what it is that that they are going to be about yet. I made some earlier when I was listening to the Hawkeye football game, and they sort of, I guess, ended up with titles like, you know, Blue 42 and First and 10 and stuff like that because I was listening to the football game when I was doing that. You know, uh, I'm sort of now hanging out and drawing and drinking beer, and maybe that'll affect it. Another thing I enjoy doing in the autumn. But at this point, I'm just trying to figure out what I want to do compositionally. And while I'm thinking about that, I sometimes think about what I want to try to do conceptually. And I sort of think of art as a relationship between craft, concept, and composition. And if it's just one of those, then that's what it is, it's craft. When it's two of those, then it's a craft with a composition. When it's three of those, it's a artwork for me. Similarly, I suppose you could have an idea that isn't crafted, and I guess that would just be called an idea. Maybe it's even an idea for art. I don't really see it as art yet, it's just an idea. Now, there have been many, many, many artists that operate with a different set of rules than me. But while I'm making artwork, I'm like, lots of times I'm thinking about those rules that govern the decisions that I'm making. And when I'm working on a series like this, where I've got lots of them that I'm sort of working on, I sort of think about what rules govern the series that I'm making, because that helps me sort of make decisions, right? And so, you know, as I'm making these random, what seems like random decisions, I'm really just sort of tracing and sort of going around the things that I think are interesting in this composition. I'm just thinking, like, is there a reason why I'm doing this? And if there is a reason why I'm doing this, does that have something to do with what I'm trying to say? Or is it just because I think it's pretty? Or because it's, you know, what seems like the right thing to do? Well, those are all sort of... Those sort of are different answers to this big question of what it is I'm trying to do. So um, I, I, when I was doing these, I was playing with the idea that uh, in my previous series, um, the Blue and Gold Banquet series, this set, right? These all started with blue and white. And then I would add just a little bit of red, and of course they were on these yellow sheets. And some of them ended up with a lot of red in them. And some of them ended up with, you know, you know, red as a sort of a as a space or a background, you know. And uh, so as I was doing this series, I was sort of initially planning to sort of avoid blue, just because I'd done so much, had used so much blue in there. But as I'd done the first couple of these, I sort of, sort of started to notice that um, they were feeling like they were kind of uh, um, a little too murky, a little too muddy. They were sort of all over the place. You know, as you can see, they are sort of just smeary and stuff. But as soon as I brought in the blue, it seemed to do some hard work of, of cleaning it up. Like, like it created a space like a sky or a water or a, a, an infinity in a way that the red and yellow weren't doing. And it sort of helped create sort of a, a, a negative space or the other space. And so I sort of arrived at the idea that I wanted to sort of continue to play with that. So one of the rules that I'm using for this particular series, and I get to create the rules because I'm the one making the stuff, um, I've decided that I want to sort of try to really play that up a little bit in here. And so I'm bringing in a little bit of that blue in each one of them as a sort of place. And so that sort of makes the place the sky. And I really like, that's something I really enjoy about Autumn, is the beautiful, beautiful contrast between the uh, um, trees that are all red and yellow and orange, especially orange, you know, that's the one that really pops for me, um, between the orange and the blues, you know, because the, the uh, blue and the sky, especially on those beautiful, beautiful autumn days like today was, you know, where you get this beautiful blue sky, 
you know, behind this orange, and you get this really great high contrast um, color combination, complementary color combination. So they're opposite each other on the color wheel, orange and blue. Um, that really, really, really just, I don't know, it just sort of takes my breath away. It really makes me happy. And so when I was thinking about whether or not to play with blue in this series, it seemed like it was an appropriate thing to do because it feels very autumn and this series seems to be about the autumn. And so it sort of seemed like that was a good idea at the time. And so far it seems to be working out as I use it in here. And so then the only question is, is where does the blue go exactly? You know, if I wanted to really make it sky, then perhaps it just goes up at the top. Then again, in many of these cases, it's hard to tell what is the top. So far, the only thing that really indicates the top is where the envelope is on the back. But many of these are better this way, and some are better this way. I guess there it's water. I don't know. But I'm, I'm continuing to play with that, and that blue seems to be a good idea most of the time. Then again, anybody that knows anything about my painting knows that I've used sort of orange and blue in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of paintings. So it seems like a pretty appropriate decision because it's not out of character for me by any stretch. I know that I enjoy it and it also helps sort of communicate part of the message here and really enhance this sort of feeling of autumn in the paintings that I'm making, or at least my favorite parts about autumn. You know, Tomorrow, if everything works out, um, I may be going to Indiana for a couple of hours, to Gary, Indiana, which is right on the other side of the border from southern Chicago. A friend of mine is doing a music show, goes along with her painting show, and she's basically going to be performing one of her paintings on the flute. and. That's all I can say about that, because I have no idea what that's going to sound like or look like. I've seen the painting. When I looked at the painting, I thought it looked very musical. It seemed very logical when she said then that she was going to be doing that. And so I'm looking forward to that show. But it also means that I'll be able to get outside on a beautiful autumn day out in the country. We'll go to the dunes, not the country, but like right on the edge of the water. So I have been thinking about that all day today. Unfortunately, this colored pencil is crap. It keeps breaking every time I sharpen it, so let's keep trying. Um, and so the idea of sitting next to the water, as I hope that I get to do tomorrow, hopefully it'll be a big, beautiful blue sky. And according to my friend Ralph, who I'll be visiting there, the, uh, oh, this colored pencil is awful. I'm going to try the other end. I was talking to Ralph on the phone today while we were uh, while I was doing these other drawings. As I said, I was talking about both colored pencils and uh, um, sharpies as being tools that we really enjoy using, but inevitably always let us down. Right when we really rely on them, sharpie will stop drawing, or the colored pencil will stop sharpening. That's exactly what's happening. If you drop colored pencils, you kind of destroy them, unfortunately. And then they are all broken up inside of the wood. They never quite sharpen right again. So I have to try to sneak out the last bit of the blue before it breaks again. And all I'm really trying to do is define a few areas and sort of separate the this black with, and the blue over here was a little too close or over here was a little too close and the blue definitely helps pull it out a little bit. Actually it'd be nice if I could bring in even a slightly lighter blue version. Let me see if I've got this in proper not work because you can't really go marker over top of colored pencil. That doesn't work too well. Let me see if I can find a lighter colored colored pencil. I might go over top.
again, inevitably, you've got a box like this that's all growing utensils and it has everything except for the color that you want. So I'm going to put out the master box. And the master box has all the colors in it. Hopefully, it will have a light blue that isn't trashed. We can bring out a few lighter tones. There's still a piece stuck in there. All I'm trying to do is right along this edge here where the black touches the blue. There isn't quite enough contrast and I just want to make it pop a little bit. The one thing I like about colored pencils is that once you have a nice layer down you can really make it pop forward. And with all of these ones that I've done so far in this series I have really no limit in terms of the rules that govern the art that I'm doing. I'm um, doing Inktober, so on one level I do want to use ink, and I want to have ink be a dominant element in it, of course. All of them I'm inking paintings, because specifically that's the sort of creative exploration I really want to do. Um, I had challenged my students this semester to Inktober, where we were going to choose one art form that we wanted to improve, and then do it every day during October. And if we couldn't do it every day, still try to post one for every day. So in this case, even though I missed a week's worth of work, I've also given them permission if they need to take a day or two off or a week off or whatever. As long as they have 31 drawings posted at the end of October, it doesn't matter. So I get to follow those same guidelines too when I need a day or two off. And now I'm starting to get a little closer. See, that blue is really starting to pop out. And so it sort of creates this sort of, like I say, sort of a, um, a nice contrast against this, this sort of orange and red and blue over here, and even around the orange and red along the outside, right? This, I'm just trying to create sort of a, a visual sort of stack of information. The white really appears to be in the foreground. The yellow seems to appear to be in the middle ground. And the blue appears to be in the background. And all of this is either sitting on top of this frame or sitting behind this frame like you're looking out a window. I'm not entirely sure. And so um, now the final things that I'm going to do on this particular one is to just go and touch up a few little things and sort of enhance a few things. I can enhance them. I can bring in a few yellows if I want to bring a few yellows back out um, to make them sort of pop forward a little bit. Now something I was doing in a lot of my other ones that I that I, I like to do, and I'm, I'm going to see if I can figure out a way to do it in this one, which is to introduce a little bit of, um, um, that's basically what I'm looking at here, to introduce a little, some, some, some geometry back in later in the picture, which is sort of where I'm at right now. So if I'm going to do it, I kind of got to do it sooner than later. Just introduce a little geometry back in by sort of pulling some, uh, some, some lines that seem to play with um, sort of relationship between the figure and the ground. Uh, basically where they sort of help really establish what's in the foreground and what's in the background. And this image is doing a pretty good job of doing it, that all by itself. If I don't do that, I'm fine. And in fact, it's not something that I've done in all of the images that I've made. So it does sort of function as an option as opposed to a requirement um, in terms of my series and sort of how I've been executing my series up to this point. But uh, um, what I'm going to try to do, or what I'm going to see if I can do, is to lay in a few lines that sort of sort of create a... Um, that sort of create a... 
that basically run through the background, I should say. That's the sort of the easiest way to say it. Basically, some lines that sort of show that that this blue is in the background and not in the foreground. It's pretty clear that it's in the background, not in the foreground. The way that I would probably go about doing that, or the way that I've done it in some of my former pieces, is to bring in some geometry, and it's not really geometry, to bring in some straight lines, some mechanical lines. So since all of this is very organic, all of these lines are very organic, they're very sort of, um, with the exception of the frame that goes around the outside, because all of these lines are very sort of um, um, based on the looseness of the original smearing that we did last time, um, because they're all sort of based on that, they don't have the sort of rigidity or that sort of like the same structure as some of the other ones. So what I can do is that if I want to bring some of that structure in, um, what I can do is just get, hit, it, hit it with a ruler and sort of start bringing some more structure in next. So that's what I'm going to do here in just a second. Okay. So basically, I'll, I mean, the simplest is that I could basically just sort of, uh, where do I want to put it? I'm going to start down here, just to sort of start easy. I'm just going to bring in a line, right? And I can decide how thick I want that line to be and how many layers I want to tackle. So I just brought in this stupid line, right? It's so slightly more mechanical. It's it's not attached to anything in particular. Um, but these Sharpies hate going over top of this, um, this blue, which is exactly what I want them to do. So I have to sort of be careful about doing too many because they're they're going to be inconsistent and that's all there is to it because the sharpies are actually kind of destroying them in the process of using them this way. But I do want to bring in just a few and sort of establish a sort of figure ground relationship, right? So this blue is in the background and you can see that because these lines that are in the blue go over go underneath these other lines here. They all seem to sort of go out the other way, so I'm just sort of trying to use them as a signal of where what's in the foreground, what's in the background, right? So it's somehow indicating that. And that's about it. I mean, I don't really know exactly what else I would do to this one. I, I kind of, this one feels very um, um, sort of structured. It feels kind of like a little more like a piece of architecture or uh, like a landscape uh, somehow. I mean, of course I could think about it this way, or I could think about it this way, or I could think about it this way. I'll probably be posting it this way because all of them I've posted so far have been vertical. So if they are vertical, I have to. Uh, the final thing I'm going to try to think about is, is if the white's the sort of structure of the machine, is it a machine, is it a character, is it a person, or something like that? Is there any way that I can make it pop forward a little bit more? Well, I could play with the stroke a tiny bit and sort of make it a f feel like it's got bigger stroke and therefore it's in the front, it's most in the front. I could add a few additional accents along here to sort of make it, you know, try to pop out a little bit more. But above all, what I want to try to do, and I could also darken this yellow if I want to push it back a little bit. Really what I'm trying to do is think, what type of title could I give it that might make it feel like this? Now again, I've been thinking a little bit about, you know, going to Indiana tomorrow and listening to this uh, flute painting. And thinking about the idea that this this could very well be a piece of music, that's just as much as anything else. But what type of music? I mean, this sort of feels like uh, some sort of mechanical music or some sort of, I don't know, like like a like crappy machine music. Something where it's like this machine here makes some sort of noise, but it'd be a sort of a raucous. It'd sort of be like a uh, I think a clangy noise of some sort. You know what I mean? So as I'm thinking about this, I'm looking at this. It kind of looks like. There's this weird clangy music man machine of some sort, you know, climbing around in the rocks and the dunes. And we're going to, me and Ralph are going to go hiking in the dunes tomorrow. So maybe, you know, these are autumn dunes and this is some sort of, I don't know, like robot machine, a uh, music, music robot of some sort or music, I don't know. Definitely, you know, autumn dunes or um, maybe it's like sort of, um, I don't know. I can play with words. I, I, we'll figure out exactly what I title it in a minute. I'm thinking, but but that's that's where my brain's going right now. Something about this this machine being, you know, some music man in the dunes or a music machine, you know. Uh, 